we're going back to rock art, and uh, I think that this paper will um, overlap some of the things that Chesha has already mentioned. This is mostly uh, kind of a sum up of what I did for my PhD um, at Southampton, although I'm currently working with Tasha and in the um, Scotland's Rock Art Project. Um, and uh, I have mentioned bits of this of this project in other um, in other papers. So if you have seen me before, please bear with me. Uh, but this is mostly about the methodology and how I approached um, my well, my my. So Atlantic Rock Art. So I, I studied Atlant Atlantic Rock Art for many years before uh, starting my PhD, and uh, there are obvious similarities between the type, this type of rock art across a number of uh, countries in um, in Atlantic Europe. Um, and uh, and so I, I always consider Bradley's work to be my starting point because he was effectively the first person who developed a methodology that would contrast the type of rock art, or this type of rock art, in different countries. So he started stu studying Ilkley Moore in England, and then he took his approach to Spain, to Galicia, and um, he kind of looked a little bit at Ireland and a little bit of uh, at Scotland, and also um, a little tiny bit at Portugal. Um, although he was mostly focusing on on um, England and and, and Spain. Um, so I, I like to call it Atlantic art because I think following him because I, I think that it kind of encompasses really well the, the geographical scope of my of my project. So uh, these are the main countries where we find uh, Atlantic rock art. Um, some authors also consider uh, it to be present in Western France, although we don't really have open air rock art in Western France. Some other authors uh, consider it to be in Scandinavia. But these are the main countries where we have all this kind of group of characteristics that I will be talking about. So uh, just very briefly, because uh, obviously you've seen a lot of the, the, the types of carvings that we have in Atlantic art. Um, the main uh, iconography is mostly composed of circular motifs, so we have a lot of cup marks, we have a lot of cup and rings, um, and other derivatives, we have spirals. Um, and there are some special motifs like uh, the human figures and the animals that are very particular to Iberia, so we won't find them um, in, uh, in outcrops in, um, in the British Isles, for instance. We also have weapons as well. Um, but all the others are more or less present in, in, in the regions that I mentioned. Um, in terms of landscape location, uh, Atlantic art in general uh, is carved. We don't know any paintings um, yet. Um, and uh, it's usually carved on boulders or outcrops in, uh, the, uh, in the open, so in the wider landscape, in relatively accessible um, areas as well. And uh, as Trisha mentioned, chronologically, in terms of chronology, there is this. Uh, there used to be this idea that Atlantic art was something belonging to the uh, or being made during the Bronze Age, but now we have um, mostly agreed that it started being created sometime in the Neolithic. Um, so then, uh, knowing more or less what I wanted to assess, I kind of defined the uh, the main research questions for my for for my project, and I was very interested in looking at the cultural context and the social context of Atlantic art, which is something that in rock art studies is usually neglected. Um, and also, I was interested in uh, trying to figure out what the connections between these regions would be, considering that the rock art is so similar in all these areas. Um, and so I decided to um, choose five study areas, one in each of these countries, um, that I've selected according to a very specific um, to very specific criteria, so obviously they all had to have uh, Atlantic art and a minimum sample of 30 uh, rocks uh, in a relatively contained area. So I was looking at a geomorphologically defined area. So in, in my case, I decided to go with peninsulas and a mountain and a plateau. Um, and so these are the areas that, that I came up with. So I have the Macros in Scotland, I have Rombolds Moor in, uh, in England, Eva Peninsula in, in Ireland, uh, Barbanza Peninsula in uh, in Galicia and also Montefiore in um, in Portugal. So um, the thing about Atlantic art and having been to all these places and having seen a lot of it uh, out in the field is that we have all these similarities and all these characteristics are uh, we can find them in all these countries and they all look very similar if you look at it from a wide kind of perspective. But if you start looking at them. There, there are some differences between them that are very difficult to, 
to, uh, to pinpoint. So if I am to compare cup and rings with cup and rings, that will hardly be um, very logical, really. Um, so I had to find a way to compare these areas and find out what was it about them that was similar and it was different, but in a robust in a robust um, way. So I had the shapes and the carving techniques that look similar, the landscape locations as well. Um, and so I needed to, to, to find out what was the difference between them as well. Because we often look at similarities, but we don't really tend to look at the differences. Um, and so I came up with this multi-scalar interdisciplinary uh, methodology based on four different scales of analysis, going from the small motifs to the, the wider landscape. Um, I was mainly interested in ignoring modern administrative um, borders because they're, obviously they're all artificial. Um, and, uh, and all the analysis that I did were also based on empirical data because I um, set myself out to go into all my study areas and record personally the, um, the rocks, the, the carved rocks. Um, so the results of, uh, of, of, these, of these analyses um, fit in this uh, categorical scheme that I devised um, where I was going to articulate the different uh, aspects that I studied for each scale um, of analysis. And this categorical scheme in the end uh, ended up being composed of 11 categories, um, each of them subdivided in, in, um, in attributes and I, I ended up with a total of 304 attributes that characterize Atlantic Heart from the finest detail to the largest ones, so the very, very small uh, details of the, of the carvings um, to the landscape location. Um, so in terms of the, uh, of the wider scale, the environmental scale, I was interested in finding out what, what are the location patterns um, at, in a wider perspective, so within, say, the peninsula, but I was also, I had to subdivide it into a smaller one, what I call the local scale, because otherwise I would lose the perspective of the smaller groups or arrangements of groups of carved, of carved rocks. Um, so to give you an idea, Iver Peninsula has about 70, is about 70 kilometers um, wide, and uh, if I was to do, say, GIS analysis at that scale, I think that I would lose all the perspectives of the smaller groups that are contained within the smaller valleys. So I had to kind of um, juggle this and, and subdivide it. I was also interested in contrasting a few, um, a few preconceived ideas that we have about, about Atlantic art. So um, that stem from other people's um, work. So for instance, we, we often hear that you know, rock art is close to watercourses, rock art is close to um, I don't know, mountains. Um, and so I needed to contrast all these and I wanted to know exactly what, why, you know, try to find out why the rock art is there, if it's effectively because of the water course or if there are any other uh, reasons behind it. Um, so to do that, I did a few uh, GIS analysis that I'm not going to go into much detail here, but basically I looked at aspect and slope, prominence, uh, and mostly visibility studies because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of studies about visibility and, and people tend to think that this was a really important characteristic of the, the, uh, the rock art's location. And so I did with view sheds from, you know, single view sheds from each of the carved rocks. I did cumulative view sheds. Also, uh, I looked at the prominence of the rocks from the landscape towards them um, and also into visibilities between rocks. Some of these, um, or most of my analysis, were tested for significance and also related to each other. So, for instance, the aspect with the visibility, with the visibility analysis. And they were also, more, impro more importantly, contrasted with my own field observations. Uh, because I thought that I needed to bring a more humane approach to this, and I, I'm, I'm slightly skeptical sometimes about, uh, you know, what, what you're doing with your GIS analysis. You're just uh, creating the affordances of the terrain, and obviously we're humans and we are unpredictable. And so I thought that we should be bringing a more humane kind of perspective into the uh, landscape approaches, with all the obstacles that that may bring. Because of course, if we're doing say mobility analysis. At the time, they didn't really have the roads that we have or the walls that we have to jump when we're out in the field or the gates to open or anything like that. Um, and so, and it was really interesting because I had quite contrasting results at times, which was a little bit conflicting when it came to interpreting them. But um, 
anyway, and so I had a list of, um, of questions that I wanted to ask while in the field um, of the rocks regarding their location um, in the landscape. So what I really tried to do was um, follow what Stuart Eve called an embodied GIS and really bring, into, bring this, this um, human perspective into the landscape, so a sensorial perspective into the landscape approach and uh, complement what the computer analysis will, didn't give me. So a second scale of analysis was a sensorial scale where I was mostly interested in uh, looking at the type of rocks where the carvings were uh, created, so the medium, the boulders, the, um, the outcrops. So I was looking at their characteristics, uh, the uh, use of natural, fish, uh, natural elements like fissures and hollows to create the motifs, the spatial organization of the images, because sometimes you have them really widespread on the uh, surfaces, other times they're very kind of close together, um, and also I was interested in, in, in looking at how the designs were structured. Um, so for instance, I found out that there are a few superimpositions between motifs, which is something that t traditionally we don't really think that Atlantic art has. We say that the, the motifs are carved up alongside each other, that there are hardly any superimpositions, and this was quite a nice surprise. Um, and uh, like the previous, uh, okay, <laughs> like the previous scale of analysis, um, I also um, contrasted, so I did a lot of work in situ, but also um, I did a, a lot of analysis of uh, 3D models uh, that I've created. Finally, my small, or my, my smallest um, scale was looking at the details of the motif, so their shape, the structure, the sections of the grooves, and also the carving techniques. Um, so initially I started recording everything with RTI, I, I, I heard someone asking something about RTI Stosha previously, and I did find a lot of difficulties trying to record rocks with, uh, with this technique, mostly because outdoors we don't always have good conditions to, uh, to, to um, have like a very stable camera for instance, because you know, we're in Scotland for instance and there's always wind everywhere. Um, but also because sometimes the rocks are very big and we need to have them, and they're flat, so we need to have them at a very high distance, and I couldn't really, uh, well, I didn't have the technical um, means to do that. So I recorded most of it with photogrammetry, uh, which was my preferential uh, digital technology, which allowed me to uh, record um, in a more unbiased way, the, uh, or reproduce the, 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 the carvings on the surfaces, but also it was really useful during field work because it's just, as, it's just easy to you know, capture a few pictures just to confirm whether that rock has any carvings or not. But it was also, but because I was producing um, detailed uh, foot, um, models or high-resolution high models, I was able to look into the details that I needed for um, the, uh, the interrogations that I was interested in. And so I created a very detailed um, motive variation category, which enabled me to uh, conclude that there are such fine details in the production of these, or the creation of these models, of these motifs, sorry. Um, and, that, and, and some of these are actually found in different regions. And so I started thinking that really what we have here is a network of connection, um, which is not is not uh, difficult to uh, to um, to imagine why because we know of other uh, materials and other technologies that have traveled through uh, during the Neolithic and so on and so uh, I started thinking that this knowledge of how to make Atlantic art and how to use it probably uh, traveled along with um, with that as well uh, so I was just going to show some carving techniques that I identified. Again, some of them are very specific and I was able to identify them in different uh, study areas. Um, and also some details that, um, that the photogrammetry brings up. So um, I started analyzing all of this, so this categorical scheme with uh, presence absent matrix, which was good because it started highlighting the differences that I started kind of um, uh, identifying in the field, but I had such a massive amount of data that this was really not very useful at all um, for what I wanted. And, uh, and I did this in, in a, a phased way. So I started by doing, just introducing the main category, so just saying whether does, you know, does it have cup marks or not, does it have cup and rings or not. And then a second stage, uh, I, I introduced some of the uh, characteristics of Atlantic art, people say, you know, they're located in kind of uh, half, 
you know, slopes or whatever. So I started slowly introducing more and more of the characteristics that I defined from in my categorical scheme. And in the end, I just put all of them together. So the third approach is with, with everything. Um, and really what, what this started to tell me is that there is this group that I called quintessential Atlantic art of, of core characteristics of Atlantic art that is present in all of my study areas. And then there are regional preferences. And I wanted to test this. Um, and so I resorted to a network analysis. And uh, we, I did this with, uh, with Tom Brugmans. Um, and we came up with this two-mode affiliation uh, network, um, which was basically relating the panels with their attributes. Uh, and then I had to, uh, I had to, um, to reproject it as a one-mode, yes, a one-mode um, network. So basically, I'm going to have to flip through these ones really quickly. And basically, what we what we could conclude is that there is a very high degree of similarity between all the rocks in all of my study areas, because that's one of the things that Atlantic uh, that uh, the network analysis allowed me to do was to look at it in an interregional way. So I don't have to tell the program or the software which rock belongs to which country. It's, I just put everything in one bag. Um, and basically, so this, this map, for instance, is showing that there is a very high degree of similarity, but it's not really kind of bringing out any um, patterns, any logics, because um, it's basically taking in all of the um, connections. So even the ones like one panel for one attribute, everything is represented there. So we had to reproject it, and uh, we used a Louvain modularity community um, method to group the, uh, the the main attributes and basically what it does is it kind of uh, ignores the uh, the weakest links in the in the network so this is the package and what the package is showing and I, again I did this in a phased way so uh, I started with the package which is the core um, characteristics that I mentioned previously and what this is saying is that basically it's present everywhere um, and then again I did this in a phased way so um, first approach, the second approach, and the third approach would correspond to the present substance matrix approaches that I did. Um, and basically, if you, I don't know if you can see it from there, but basically what this is showing is that the more attributes that I'm including, the more uh, the regions become um, kind of connected. So um, what this basically is showing is that there are a very strong uh, regional preferences, very strong personalities to each of these of these um, of these characters. So, um, regions. Sorry. So uh, basically, this kind of confirms my ha or potentially I hope so or I thought so, and I still like to think so that this confirms my hypothesis that there was this uh, core group of, of characteristics that traveled but then developed um, on its own due to you know local uh, cultural different backgrounds and things like that. Uh, and I think I better finish, so thank you.